mic program. Thank you. Um, I will start with this mic and then move over to the next one, I think. Uh, thank you, Madeleine, for leading the morning session and the lunch session of this meeting. Uh, my name is Alice Sundfjord. I am an associate at Stockholm Environment Institute and work with the Siani Secretariat. And in the Siani Secretariat, uh, we all do various things. Uh, but one thing that I do in particular is our monitoring, evaluation and learning work. And I will guide you through this last one and a half hours of this annual meeting. Um, in the morning, we've heard of new perspectives on food systems transformation and also the challenges that we have in our food system. Uh, and now over lunch, we heard so many interesting discussions that you had uh, and your thoughts on Siani's role and your role in uh, Siani's network. And I was very inspiring being part of uh, Linus group there in the corner as well. Um, so I feel very energized uh, for this last part as well, uh, because now we will look a bit forward into Siani's upcoming phase and how we see that Siani as a network play a role in food systems transformation. And as you might have heard, um, especially from Madeleine in the beginning of the day, Siani is now moving into its fourth phase, or it actually just started in January 2023. And for this new phase, uh, we have developed uh, a new theory of change. So a new um, illustration like that you can see on the screen on how we see ourselves moving from the inputs that we have, the resources and neighbors that we have, all the way to a final impact or vision statement. And this new vision statement has been developed uh, in the Secretariat together with the steering committee, with inputs from our members, our followers, partners, and also related to the global context in which we operate. Um, so as, you, as Madeleine said this morning, our new impact or vision statement is food systems are more sustainable, rights-based and inclusive of smallholder farmers, small and medium-sized enterprises, and marginalized groups. And this is quite broad, very ambitious, uh, something that many organizations perhaps can relate to. And Siani has been spending a lot of time thinking about how we can make a contribution to this vision. Uh, Siani is only one actor among many, like we have seen today, all of you coming together from different organizations or from different companies uh, or as individuals. Um, and we have um, decided um, that we can make a contribution through four different categories of activities and outputs. And you can see those in this column of the screen. So Siani will, during the next five years in this fourth phase, uh, have activities and outputs related to knowledge management and communication, amplification and awareness raising, inclusive multi-stakeholder dialogue and community building. Um, and to implement activities related to these four activities, um, the network function and the interactions that we have among each other with our members, our followers and more strategic partners um, is really our key strength. Um, and I haven't been with Siani for too long, only a year and a half, but I understand that this is something that has been built up over the last 10 plus years. Um, and Siani has grown to become uh, a hub for organizations working towards a similar vision, both in Sweden, but also globally. And in the next session, next half hour, we would like to illustrate the broad interactions, uh, our broad network, and also the benefits of being part of a network, both within Siani and beyond. Uh, since while Siani is a network, all our partners and organizations and followers also have their own networks uh, spreading further than what Siani can reach. And to do this, we have invited three people that have been interacting with Siani in different ways both in the past and currently. Um, 
And together with these people, I would like to have a conversation quite informally, I hope, um, about how we can make good interactions and what good interactions entail, but also look a bit forward and scan the horizon on what kind, what type of thematic areas or topics that they see as important in the upcoming years and how we can come together to amplify these and share knowledge around um, new issues that might not have been on the agenda before. So I would like to give a warm welcome to Bo Lager, Senior Policy Advisor in Agriculture at the International Department of the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. Uh, I would also like to welcome Linda Andersson, Director of Communications at AXE Foundation. And um, Mats Forsmar, Deputy Managing Director at the Expert Group for Eight Studies. Um, we'll have to figure out the microphones as well. Don't feel so. No, it's. This is also something new with meeting in person, right? You have to learn all the tech things and are we, are we... so used to Zoom. Yeah, I can use this one. Great. I hope it's all right, Linda, without the table. Just, I know we were discussing. Yeah. 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 No, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Sitting on the line, everyone can see it's perfect. Uh, I'm really honored to have the three of you here up on stage. And I think we can share uh, some very important learnings from your previous interactions with Siani uh, or in your uh, current roles as well in your different organizations. Um, and as I said, I kind of see this conversation uh, relating to two different topics. So first the interactions and the connections that we make, but also the thematic areas that we uh, look forward to work with in the future. Um, so starting on the first topic, um, if you, all three of you could give examples of how you in your current role uh, in your organizations or you as individuals have worked across sectors uh, in your uh, respective uh, topics and what you see has been successful factors in these interactions. Um, Linda, I know uh, you will show us a picture of the interactions you have in Axe Foundation, so I'll start with you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Super, thanks. Um, well, so uh, Axe Foundation is a non-profit organization, an independent organization, and we basically work with sustainable development. Um, and we do that uh, through cross-sector collaboration. So I would say cross-sector collaboration is, is basically in our DNA. And why do we do this? Because, well, when we take on quite complex sustainability challenges and try to develop really hands-on practical solutions. We do this within um, the things we buy, the, the resources we use and the food we eat. And there is no way we could do this without our partners and without the cross-sector collaboration. Um, today we are around uh, 20 colleagues, 25, 20 colleagues, and we run 25 projects with 300 partners. And what we do is we are specifically trying to build researchers and practitioners to get the research out there in practice. And um, beyond the researchers, I think we have around 70 of them in our network, it's extremely important to work with the practitioners, with the farmers, with the uh, businesses, with the entrepreneurs, because that's where the action is going to happen in the end. And without that, nothing would have been possible. 
so for us, gathering everyone around the same table is what makes us being able to solve those complex issues. No matter if we take on uh, a new perennial grain or um, a new sustainable rice in Pakistan, for example. Very interesting. Yeah, and as you can see on the screen, uh, you also shared this image with us of, of your network. So yes. Thank you for that. Uh, Mats, your background is in research and you now work at the, uh, you've been working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and now at the Expert Group for Aid Studies. How have you collaborated across sectors in your roles? Well, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my, my position, the Expert Group for Aid Studies, this is a government committee uh, under the foreign ministry and we're supposed to evaluate and analyze Swedish development cooperation and um, maybe I, I should argue a bit for for silos uh, is, isn't that opportune uh, because we we um, we work with academia and as you know in academia you need to speci be specific and, and, and specialize on areas and uh, we we ask academic uh, researchers to write for us to do evaluations or studies uh, and they become very specific specific at times but then we need to the, the, it's all about communication it's all about bridging uh, research and policy uh, the ministry is our main target group but also research and practice and uh, in doing that we need to add things and we need to work with multiple actors uh, in that to to uh, sort of bring them on board and, and see the fuller picture. Because if you don't see uh, the larger picture, uh, your specific knowledge doesn't really make sense. So in that sense, we need to think all the, all the time, how can we complement this piece of, of knowledge? But I'm now talking at, at, a, at a level of... Um, uh, policy, you know, national uh, Swedish policies, which we try to uh, to influence or or help. Uh, of course, there are n a number of other levels and and areas where we we all need to work on policies, and and sort of collaborate across uh, disciplines, across uh, uh, f fields of knowledge. Uh, so, so take this as an example of, of something. Uh, we talked over lunch here, uh, um, Jötte and I, about uh, what, what it takes to take on new technology. And I had this uh, example from Burkina Faso, where I've been working a bit, uh, on um, farmers taking on knowledge from extension workers. There is a need of, of some trust or some... Um, um, closeness in order to to be able to take on the technology exactly the same said Jota in Sweden uh, for for farmers and and maybe it's the case also in in sort of this policy dialogue that you need to build some trust you need to communicate you need to to listen to each other because the research community is one thing there is a policy community there's a need also for for um, uh, policy translation to to sort of make these two worlds meet, uh, which is rather challenging at times. So maybe I'll stop there because I talked a lot. And that's perfect. And I love that you're tying uh, your thoughts as well to what you've heard today um, and uh, that this has sparked new ideas. Ooh, would you like to add anything from your experiences uh, working all over the world? All right. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting um, us to this uh, very interesting meeting. Uh, first of all, I'm working for the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. So it's the biggest environmental organization in Sweden. And uh, of course, we have 200,000 members here in Sweden. And we, uh, so we are really, that is our core of this organization. And, and that is the the members that we are communicating and they are providing sort of the 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 really work that the organization is doing but we're also the one of the frame organizations to see that and we do a lot of a lot of work uh, internationally uh, so the the core i mean what i want to say is really that uh, you know our our theory of change is really about building local partners organization and the strength of local partner organization and i think that is 
is really important. And we, we do that through our networks in, in all parts of the world. And I just want to mention um, for what we are doing, uh, one of the things that we are doing in, in Africa is to uh, uh, be part and, and of the ac uh, Ecological Organic Agriculture Initiative. And uh, this is a part of the African Union. Uh, and actually the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation was part of establishing this. So this is a, a network of organizations covering now 12 countries. And uh, the aim is really to bring in agroecology and to spread agroecology uh, throughout Africa. And we do that uh, our, by influencing, by supporting our local organizations who are, who are part of this. Uh, as, uh, for example, there is a continental steering uh, secretariat for this. And one of our partner organizations is, is sort of managing them. So I, do, I, I just want to really say how important it is that we are supporting the local networks and the local partner organization to become stronger and really not only focus on the, on the projects and the product implementation, the targets, but also make sure that these organizations and their institutions are strong and that we look at also the like the African Union, where we can have a big influence. Uh, you know, for example, that the African Union member states have, have set up a target of about the 10% of the, of the public expenditure should go to agriculture. And we know that is not happening today, uh, just a, a very small percentage. And I think uh, by strengthening our mem sort of member civil society organizations, we can also influence policy at a, at a high level. So I think, um, yeah, that, that's, um, <laughs> that's my experience. Very interesting. And I think that also illustrates what I said before about Ciani as a network, but through our partners and followers and people that work together with Ciani, um, connections and interactions are also expanded to local organizations that are supported by the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation and Axe Foundation's partners and policy uh, through the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and uh, other government agencies. Um, interesting what you said with trust uh, and also bringing people to, to the same table uh, to start the dialogue, I guess. But how do we increase trust then? Like what is, what is the factor uh, to get people to sit down and start working together. Do you have any ideas on that, perhaps? Uh, well, yes. Um, <clears throat> one challenge that we, of course, have at Axe Foundation is that when we're trying to develop a new solution, for example, um, let's say within um, uh, the retail industry in Sweden, we need to gather all the major players in the retail industry in Sweden. So we have Ica, we have Coop, we have Axfood, we have all the others. And they normally don't sit down together and, and share their secrets for natural reasons. <laughs> uh, so when we gather them, we need to build that trust and to make them share just enough secrets to solve the sustainability issue, but not enough, uh, but not more uh, to, to hamper with the, with the competition. And I think an important part is to, when you gather all these um, actors, um, our secretary general all, all, all often says that it's between those organizational gaps that the magic happens. When you can gather both competitors uh, and researchers um, and farmers on the same table and dare them to um, dig into the problem itself. Set a common ground first on how much you can share, but then also dare them to share the actual problem and dig into that and um, start to understand um, what's in it for every single person around that table. It's not until you understand the true benefit for me and for you that you can also gain a common ground. So I think what we start with 
after, of course, setting all the regulatory work on what you can share and not, it's about finding what is our common ground? What is our, uh, what is your problem, your problem and your problem and how can we address it together? Then you kind of build that trust and can start to find the solution. If we would dig into the solution from start, we would end up creating a great solution for maybe you as a farmer, but it will not benefit you as a retailer or, or you as a consumer. So that common ground is truly important. So to, to build on that, I think uh, this uh, there is a need of an openness and, and sincerity. You cannot come with with a pre-cooked uh, message. Uh, you have to be open and a bit curious yeah. uh, to to listen to people and really really listen. Uh, so so uh, that curiosity that uh, often uh, is uh, is what drives you as a researcher. I think would be helpful uh, because you're open to to finding new things and you don't know in advance what it will where it will end. I think that is important. Uh, otherwise, you're not perceived as someone who is sincere or yeah. is open enough. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, but as I mean, uh, standing your ground can be important and really aim for the highest and most effective and the best solution ever. But getting a common ground might be the best way forward. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if we take um, the antibiotic criteria that X Foundation developed with exactly all the players in the Swedish industry and with researchers and CSOs, um, we sat down together with them and said, we need to set up criteria for when we are buying meat, dairy and fish in Sweden. Uh, criteria that can uh, improve animal welfare, but also reduce the use of antibiotics uh, in food producing animals. If each of these organizations had come to the table standing their ground on we can only accept the greatest solutions ever, we would never have made it. Did we get the criteria that they are the strongest and the best ever? No. Did we get a criteria that is possible to implement? Yes. So that might be more important than the other one. And also, it might not be the end solution that is the most important. It might not be the criteria that is the result itself. It might be that the learning process when having these dialogues and getting new perspectives and new ways of understanding each other and actually understanding how the entire food system or the entire value chain works, that might be more important than getting the absolute best product out there. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, I mean, uh, I'm happy to hear that trust is coming up because I mean my experience from working uh, before I came to to the my this organization I was working with IUCN in Myanmar and we did uh, a lot of uh, landscape uh, approach approaches and part of that was really to bring in uh, all stakeholders from from all sectors in the society uh, at the same time at the same table and discuss these things and what really came up is that yeah, they didn't have any trust in each other. They didn't trust each other. So I think that is that is something we can uh, we can really really learn from. And um, I mean, the World Research Institute and IUCN have developed an excellent tool for the restoration opportunities assessment methodology, which is really sort of taking on this that you know to yeah, I mean, to reach a, a common goal, we need to gather all the players in a community. The, the private sector, of course, needs to be there. The government needed, the civil society need to be there. So um, I think that's a big, it's a big lesson. And trust has to be built, you know, trust is nothing that just comes automatically. Definitely. And thank you for sharing such concrete examples. I think this is just what we need uh, in this room as well and take learnings into the Siani network. Uh, we were also discussing at our table over lunch that uh, bringing in these actors and finding a common ground also kind of uh, requires a bit of courage as well. It's easy to praise to the choir and gather the people that might think the same way as you do or have the same visions or same goals. Um, but you can have a greater spread and impact maybe of your thoughts if you dare to uh, create new um, relationships and trust. Mats? I have one example. Uh, I. I understood that Siani was formed back in 2000, was it eight? eight? Yeah. Around an issue, uh, one, one important issue at the time was to sort of convince the Swedish government that uh, it should uh, in, um, invest more in agriculture within its development corporation. 
uh, I was um, promised to Ivar Virgin, who wrote a uh, report for us at the EBA last year, to bring a copy and, and say that uh, uh, they, they studied how much uh, of Swedish development cooperation goes into agriculture. So the report is there. Uh, but uh, the trick is, if you sort of are convinced that agriculture is so important, uh, and I am convinced of that, and I'm part of, of the lobby then, um, uh, you, you, uh, there is must be some reason why we are not so successful in having more uh, agriculture in development cooperation. There must be other stories out there. Uh, and and that might be a challenge for, for all of us here. Uh, I know that Sian is much more than this issue now. Uh, and it has many fronts. Uh, but I, I think this front still remains. Um, and uh, we need to think about why is it that that uh, this issue is coming back and back uh, again and again? We found out in in this mapping of Swedish aid to agriculture that more is is being done than is reported. It's reported under uh, other headlines, so it's like five six percent of of total Swedish aid which goes to agriculture in different forms. The official figure is three percent, uh, and there are differences between different countries, etc. But but I think this is a case for us to think about. Uh, if we want this policy dialogue and want this influence, uh, who else is around there? And what are other stories are around? And, and how can we be more convincing in that? So uh, I, I, I provoke you a bit. <laughs> That's, it's good to provoke. And I think that leads quite well into the second topic that I wanted to discuss uh, in this panel, kind of the thematics uh, looking forward and what areas or topics related to food systems, which is very broad, um, is on, on your horizon and how can Siani as a network amplify that? You mentioned the role of agriculture maths uh, and so many more things can be connected to agriculture uh, without us realizing it as well, perhaps. Mm. Um, Bo, do you want to start? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, it has been realized, of course. I mean, we are in the middle of a, a transition. We need to, to change our food system. Everyone agrees on that. So how do we do that? And I think um, one of the, the areas that have sort of gained a lot of traction in the, in the last yeah, five years is uh, agroecology. And uh, of course, our organization is really, that's something that we are supporting. Uh, our partner organizations in Africa. And we believe that is, uh, I mean, it's really one of the things that um, that can really yeah, gain traction and uh, improve the livelihood of, of farmers in, in Africa. And I'm, I mean, I'm also glad that there is other organization taking up this. And it, of course, F FAO has their own agroecology hub and um, also, um, uh, even the CDR system have taken up with the, trans, uh, the transformative partnership on agroecology. So, so I think uh, yeah, that this is one of the area that I think uh, Siani can sort of uh, ship into uh, in the theme of agroecology. Mm -hmm. With the help of uh, of your organizations, of well, course. Of course. <laughs> uh, Linda, <clears throat> you know, what are your ideas? Well, uh, when you ask the question, what is our focus and what are the great thematic areas going forward? I mean, it's um, it's not so fun, but it's I mean, it's the food crisis, it's the climate crisis, and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, they are quite big areas to to tackle, of course. Um, and at Axe Foundation, we we try to break them down, of course, to to eat the elephant. Um, things that are at our focus right now, when it comes to farming per se and the future of food. Um, is both uh, the sustainable use of resources. I mean, just the thought that we, we throw away so much food in Sweden and elsewhere uh, from farm to plate is absolutely outrageous. And finding solutions on how to use those rest flows, both in the high technology food industry, but also at the smallholder farmer level is something that we really need to address going forward. 
Um, and then also, of course, the issue we have with our food, eating our food. How come that we feed our, um, our fish with wild caught fish and imported soy when it's perfectly fine to eat insects or, or waste products? So those residual streams needs to be addressed, definitely. Um, the other topic is, of course, biodiversity. Um, I mean, the, um, the issue with the carbon offsetting has both uh, been praised and, and complained about. And up is upcoming is the biodiversity uh, offsetting or the bi biodiversity solutions. So I'm really intrigued to see what this will bring forward. Um, how can we increase biodiversity both uh, in the, on the planet and on the plate? And how can farmers be paid for those biodiversity measures that they need to take? Is it through offsetting? Is it through um, premium pricing? Is it through uh, certifications? I don't know, but somehow it it needs to be put on put on some somehow on the on the price tag in the end, but for the consumer. Thank you, Mats. Do you have anything to add from Ooh. your perspective? There's so many issues, so I don't know where to start <laughs> uh, because there is such a need for for increased knowledge and uh, and digging into uh, a number of issues that we've been touching on uh, today and, and more than that. So uh, this is overwhelming in a way. Uh, I'm, I'm conservative in the sense that I th still think that agriculture's rule for poverty reduction is important, in especially in low-income countries, and that needs to be stressed over and over again. Um, we know also about about the about all the crisis that you talk, talked about, Linda and and Caroline talked about this morning. Um, but is it so that we uh, is that the new normal? Um, well, it's part of the new normal, but but we still have an old normal as well. Uh, there are countries that are not still on that on that conflict list. Um, I've, I've worked and lived in a country, Burkina Faso, where we saw this uh, evolve in front of our eyes and we were uh, unable to tackle it in a good way. Uh, so we, we just, uh, when I left uh, 2018, Burkina last time uh, working there, we had 10,000 internal refugees. Today it's 1.7 million. Uh, that's not so many years uh, for that. And why is it? Well, conflicts, uh, but also uh, failing food systems, failing food production. Um, when you are dependent on natural resources for your livelihood, you need flexibility. You need to move between different areas uh, of income uh, sources. And when that flexibility is threatened and your your circumscribed that's when it's dangerous and and problem comes conflict comes um i'm convinced that that uh, social protection is important in those kind of settings in order to raise production uh, you should look at at production not only from the side of techniques or improved techniques that is uh, all needed and important, but social protection is important because you don't, you need to invest in something else than your relations. If you uh, if you are threatened, you invest in your relations because you need help when when crisis strike strike. So so that is one area. We now have one hundred million uh, refugees in the world. Fifty nine millions are internal refugees, uh, internally displaced people. They live in, in villages, in cities, etc. Uh, not so much in camps. Uh, if they are given an opportunity to find a livelihood, they are often given some piece of land to cultivate. That's the uh, first, first uh, uh, thing done. And the, the land they get are often the worst lands. So this is an area we, we need to look into that, how to, to change that, how to work with local communities in order to uh, accommodate all these uh, refugees. That's part of the crisis. But we also need to work on, on the more long-term uh, building development uh, scheme. And social protection can play an important role there as well. So, so 
some highlights from from so many areas, but but there are so many issues. I should, of course, also mention that we need to work on water, but that has been mentioned earlier, so I just uh, second that. Um, what else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One other idea, uh, Sa Samon from, from Ghana, I liked your intervention uh, because you look at what is what is the way uh, people uh, adapt, how do th people th uh, do to uh, to deal with the situation that is something that we should look more into what are the things ongoing that that may be positive developments look into that learn from it build on it mm. i think that is really important so thank you for for your work and intervention this morning thank you oh, you yeah i, I just wanted to uh, say i mean we we need to think uh, differently and i think linda was uh, talking about i mean how our consumption pattern is is affecting uh, our food system and uh, and of course the climate. And uh, I think I read somewhere that we are only sort of consuming fifty five percent of the calories uh, from from crops. So it's uh, I mean and maybe uh, two three third three fourths of the land is occupied by by uh, grazing and uh, or we grow crops for to feed our animals. So. We need to think differently. Uh, so that is the the transformation we need to go through, and that means that we have to think different uh, ourselves uh, on what we are doing. And I I remember the, this Eat uh, Lancet uh, Commission that was presenting uh, like five strategies in 2019, and the first one was that we, yeah we need to we need to consume more more plant based food. And, and that's a simple. So how do we do that? And I think that's something for Siani to, uh, to, to take on. I'm also thinking of um, agriculture. I mean, as one of the actually the largest emitter of, of carbon, but also, uh, I mean, carbon is, agriculture is also a, a huge opportunity because uh, all our soils are, are storing carbon. So, um, so we, we need to both I mean, mitigate and use agriculture to mitigate for climate change, but also it's uh, it, it's also uh, part of the solution. Thank you, Lina. Yeah. Did you have anything else to add, or no? I'm just thinking about. I mean, <clears throat> Siani as an actor definitely both have the the competence and uh, the commitment and the courage to to address these issues and to gather all these actors around the same table. Um, and I think that's something that we truly should make use of. Um, at the same time, um, there is, I think, Siani, look, just looking out in this room, I see so many new and old colleagues and friends from both civil society and from, from public authorities and public actors and research. But there is quite a few in this room from the private sector, I think. I might have missed a few, but there are quite a few. And I think to really be successful, we need to get everyone on board. Um, because in the end, there is someone buying these products. There is someone investing in agriculture. And I think those need to be here as well. And um, I think that's something that we can work on, definitely. Yeah, to to reach out to new connections like yeah. we were discussing before. And it's interesting to hear you coming from different perspectives, but still, I can still see some overlaps, uh, talking about local communities, uh, finding innovative solutions to, to the crisis that is actually a fact. Uh, so thank you all for raising that. Um, time is running short. Um, I would like to ask you one final question, um, also related to connections. So in one sentence, um, could you, what is um, a new connection that you have made in the room today from the morning? <laughs> I can start with you, Bud. Oh, um... I haven't made it yet, but there are There's a number time. of people I'd like to, to talk to here. So I understood that there's uh, so, so much of competence and, and interesting perspectives in this room. Uh, I, I reconnected with Jota. We realized we had uh, been together uh, earlier. So that, that was great. Reconnection is also good, especially after the pandemic. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you. Linda, any new connections? Definitely. I met several new people at, at my table, both from Foreign Affairs and from SIDA and so on. So definitely new connections and reconnecting with some uh, new and old friends. That was also nice.
happy to hear that. Cool. Last word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I'm very happy to, I mean, to finally see people in real, in real life, not in, in on my screen. So, and uh, I've made a lot of connections. There is a lot of ideas and, and I believe, uh, I mean, there is a great future for Siani. <laughs> Those were excellent last words. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for joining us here on stage and uh, uh, see you at the mingle later. Yeah. Thanks. You can leave it on. I definitely made some new connections. Um, I think this is not my first, but the, one of the first actual in-person meetings that I've had with Siani. So I'm super excited to get faces on names that I've only heard from, uh, from my colleagues uh, and through email. Um, I'm not done just yet. Um, I wanted to continue this 